Welcome back, friends. Today, I drove the farthest I've ever driven for an episode way to Marinette, Wisconsin, which is this tiny little town of about 11,000 people north of Green Bay, to talk with a scuba diver, which I'm also a diver, which hardly anybody is aware of, but I am. Uh, so welcome to the show, Ed the Diver. Glad to be here. Dude, Thanks for thank you home. for welcoming me over to your house. This is dope. I appreciate you having me. Really good to see you over here in Marinette, Wisconsin. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful drive. I'm sure it was a nice sunny day. Yeah. How long did it take you get? Three and a half, three and a half, three forty-five. It took a while right. to get over this way. And I gotta drive all the way back, but it's it'll be it'll be okay. You might be going diving later today, huh? Um, so yeah, I'm in the process of moving right now, but I do want to get a dive in today. It's uh, really sunny out. I there might be a lot of people fishing, so you know, I gotta try to stay out of their way so I don't get snagged. Definitely diving no. this time of year is too cold, <laughs> is is it not? It's gotta oh. be super cold. No, so the water right now is about forty five to fifty degrees right now because of the warm weather we had. But I've been diving since February. Um water was like thirty two, thirty three. You know, how, how do you dive in? I mean, I know like the, the different wetsuits and stuff have different like mm -hmm. grades and everything. But one thing I've ran into when I've dove is like my lips are freezing. How do you get beyond like, how do you push through that? Is there something different that you wear that covers your entire face or? No. So um, I wear like a seven, six, five mil suit. I have five mil glove boots. Um, and then I have a, a vest that's three mil under my seven mil, you know, chest, my yeah. thing. And then I have the hood. But uh, your face will get cold. Um, your body gets cold a little bit, but it's mainly your hands and toes that just freeze within like five, 10 minutes. So you just got to power through it. Oof. Duh. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's my least favorite thing. Okay. So in your own words, I'll let you introduce yourself. Who are you and what are you passionate about? My name is Ed Bieber. I own Bieber's Underwater Recovery LLC. Uh, social media, Ed the Diver. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Um, but I just started out cleaning up the waterways. Um, actually, I started out trying to get my lures back uh, with waders. But then it, when it warmed up, warmed up, I got into uh, going underwater with just a cheap mask and uh, some shorts, tennis shoes. Started grabbing a bunch of lures underwater, throwing them on my little boogie board, which then I graduated to a basket so I could grab all the trash, all the line, all, all the stuff that didn't belong underwater. And then I ended up getting scuba certified and then it just blew up from there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of crazy. If you look, if anyone wants to go look, you're on not just one, you are on all the different platforms. And that mm -hmm. obviously takes a ridiculous amount of time. Uh, are you from Wisconsin initially? Is like this where you grew up? So I was born right in Marinette, Wisconsin at a hospital here, but I grew up on a farm. In, um, I, grew, <laughs> I was born here, but I, I, I grew up about a half hour from here, Lena, Wisconsin. Um, in between Lena and Coleman, we had an 80 acre farm, like oh, a hobby cool. farm. So we were picking rocks, bailing hay. Um, you know, we had cows, chickens, horses, donkeys, sheep, goats, dogs, cats, rabbits, everything. Yeah. How old were you when you learned how to swim? Um, probably like four, four or five. <laughs> Did you guys have ponds or anything on your property? We had one pond out there, but you know, after all the work we'd do, my dad, would, he was a he loved the water, so he'd take a skiing. He would go to different beaches. Um, there was a swing oh, rope. Yeah. You had a ski boat, like water skiing and stuff? Yep. Oh, cool. And uh, there was a, a swing rope at a place called Lee Lake where my dad actually cut his foot open when he's, uh, he's swing off this rope, then he climbed back to the bank. And I remember him cutting his foot open. And that's one of the places that I, like every year I go back there, like three, four times a year, picking up all the, all the trash from people partying, oh, throwing sure. bottles in their cans, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, you gotta be careful because there's a lot of broken glass, mm -hmm. right? So every, everybody, cause we have a lot of places like that, um, in Eau Claire too, cause Eau Claire means clear water in French. It's on the confluence of two rivers. That's where like the name of that comes from. Oh. Um, so people swim a lot and our town has, I think we just passed 70,000 people. So we're like the wow. sixth or seventh biggest, uh, city in Wisconsin. Not that that means a ton, but we're not tiny, but mm -hmm. our population more than 10,000 college students live in town wow so it's a big party town and that's kind of yeah. like we were known as just like a college town lots of partying for a long time and now it's kind of changing eau claire is becoming this like hip trendy new place that everyone's going to we have people coming from minneapolis all the time to come stay in eau claire for the weekend ever since do you know who boney bear is boney Bear? no i do not okay it looks like bon ivor He's a Grammy winner. He did an album mm -hmm. with Taylor Swift, so he's like mega famous. You've heard his music before, but probably everyone has. You just <laughs> didn't know it was him. But but anyways, he lives in Eau Claire. Okay. And so ever since he won his Grammy, all of a sudden we kind of became more of like a, a music town. But anyways, mm -hmm. all the reason I was saying all of that is a lot of the areas people swim in Eau Claire, 
there is crazy amounts of glass and everything else underneath there. And people very haphazardly just go cliff jumping and don't think anything of it. And like, mm. I'm real surprised more people haven't sliced their feet open yeah. real nasty. So you have cliffs over there, huh? Yeah. So yeah. That, those are popular spots where I find a lot of Apple watches, sunglasses, uh, necklaces, rings, all kinds of stuff. So I have an under, underwater metal detector to help find those things. Dude, I was going to ask about that. Um, really quick side thing. People always ask me, like, why do you shave that line in your head? Because I have like a, my hair doesn't grow. Uh-huh. That is, I don't shave that line in my head. The first time I ever went wakeboarding when I was like 12, um, mm -hmm. I know this is a random side story, but this for everyone that always asked me this, <laughs> um, my, I went out, we have a cabin on a lake, right? Mm -hmm. My mom was a teacher. So every summer I'd live up on the lake north of, of cable, like way up there. And one of the other kids that I hung out with that was up there, his dad had a ski boat and mm -hmm. they'd go wakeboarding. They invited me with, um, but I had to use his dad's board and those bindings. They don't like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So my feet, I like went to jump feet slipped out from the bindings when it went under and the board's so buoyant it shot right up and then the fin caught my head Eesh. yeah so i got like 12 staples in my head i got pictures of me with this like big turban on basically from when i <laughs> sliced yeah Man. yeah it was uh yeah it was real nasty but anyways um i remember my dad this is part of why i got into diving a couple of reasons but my dad had told me um one day he came back he went walk the dog or whatever he was gone for a long time mm -hmm. and he was going on and on about how he met this scuba diver down at the boat landing and he was like i never thought about scuba diving but this guy he goes around all these lakes in northern wisconsin and he finds all these engagement rings and, he, and diamond mm -hmm. earrings and all this different stuff this dude was going around with a metal detector Wow, oh. that's been on my list to get a stinking metal detector and I still haven't done it. What's mm -hmm. the coolest thing you found using the metal detector? You, I, I assume that's, you have to use that realistically to like do the recovery for people for rings and things yes. like that. Right. Cause it's all yeah. muck on the bottom. Yeah. So a lot of times if it is sand, you know, they're usually, they're playing around the sand and like a sandbar, then they're going to bury it. They step on it, especially if they, when they start looking for it, they're going to put, kick it down in the sand or yeah. for the mud stuff. You definitely need it. And now once you start stirring that mud up, you can't see anything anyway. Right. So you're just going by feel and by the sound of the, the detector. So you're just putting your hand in the mud, kind of squish between your fingers, or you're putting in some, some kind of sifter and you're, you're trying to find the property. Yeah, dude, actually check this out. So I found this one. Um, I was actually not diving. I was just uh, snorkeling, but I found that in Hawaii. Wow, that is a cool ring. Yeah, it's crazy because when underneath the water, you know how that like it tints everything? Mm -hmm. Like the, the turquoise will tint things. I used to sell jewelry a long time ago. Um, I was an assistant manager of a couple of jewelry stores, mm -hmm. which is random. But uh, I saw this under the water. I picked it up and I was like, oh, that's fake. And I almost just dropped it because the oh. coloring was so off because of the turquoise. I was like, mm -hmm. that looked like fake gold. And I was like, man, eh, whatever. And I put it in my pocket. And then I came out of the water and looked at it. And I was like, no way. And you can see it because it was underneath the water for so long that the sand like wore down that side of the design of the ring oh okay yeah so i mean it's only 10 karat gold but it is solid which is kind of dope. yeah that's my favorite thing that i've ever found what's your favorite thing you've ever found my favorite thing um i found uh there's a gun over here a model 94 uh winchester rifle lever action uh that was the, kind of the, the first real gun i found besides you know some bb gun pistols but uh uh, I got that, gave it to the sheriff's department. They uh, contacted me after three months that we couldn't find the owner or anything wrong with it. No crimes committed, so they gave it back to me. Yeah, how do you, like, we find these things from forever ago. What what does the process realistically look like when you turn it in to the police? Because it's they can't actually find where it came from. There's not fingerprints, and it's like so many years later. Yeah, um, it took, like it, they said, after three months, if we don't find anything wrong with it, you can get a hold of us again and, and claim it. So, oh, oh, it's a three month time frame. Yeah. So I don't know, like in some places that, you know, there's a lot of magnet fishers out there. They're, they're getting all these guns, pulling them out of bridge areas. Yeah. Some police departments don't let you get it back even. Huh. So, but it's like, it's like, well, why would people even want to let you know they have it if you're not going to give it, they don't have the chance to get it back. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's part <laughs> so. of it. Another random story I've never had the chance to tell. I, this is exciting for me because I'm a diver and I never get to talk about diving because it's mm -hmm. otherwise totally unrelated. I found somebody's ashes once. Me too. <laughs> Dude, what did you do? Because I felt cursed. Like I, I went and I, I was swimming, whatever, I was diving. Mm -hmm. And I saw this thing on underneath the water. And I didn't know what it was. And I was all confused. I was like, it has letters like written on it. What is it? So yeah. I, I picked it up, brought it. And then once I got on shore, I was looking at it. And my neighbors are like, oh, what'd you find? So I'm sitting around the fire, like looking at it while they're grilling, mm -hmm. like trying to wonder why would this be, what, what is this? And then it finally clicked like, oh, that's like, like birth date and death date. Oh. I totally just removed this person's urn 
from yeah. the lake. And then that night I went in my paddle boat out there with a few beers, poured one out for the homie and was yeah. like, thank you for joining me. <laughs> Don't curse me. And I put it back, which I guess was littering. But what happened with you when you found him? <laughs> so uh, I was doing a phone recovery up in uh, north central Wisconsin. Um, I found his phone and stuff, but he's told me uh, when he was underwater with his little camera thing, he saw a tackle tray. Um, so I went down there, found this uh, tackle box and had two uh, two bricks chained to this tackle box. And I pulled it up and opened it up and I noticed some ashes in the bag in there and oh, some man. other stuff. And I was like, wait, I think these are ashes. I put it back, you know, I stunk it back in the, in the water. And then recently when I found this uh, Barbie doll in uh, the Wolf River in uh, Shawano, Wisconsin, I found a cross and I had a, had a, like a, a Jesus fish on it. And I shook it. It looked very like all kind of suspicious. I'm like, I've never seen anything like this before. And after I got out of the water, I was shaking it to see if there's anything inside it. And it seemed kind of solid. So I'm like, well, there's nothing inside of it. Right. But then after the water drained out and I got home and then I started shaking and I could hear something in it. And uh, I'm pretty sure they're ashes um, because a lot of people are commenting too. Hey, that's somebody's urn. So I got to go put that back yet, but I just haven't been to Shawano yet. <laughs> yeah, man. That's one of the things I would have never expected. One time I was diving, and I know this has happened to you before. One time I was diving, and people don't realize, like, when you dive in the ocean, like, anyone who's seen Jaws, right? Like, the scary <laughs> part of Jaws, which is an old movie, it's not that scary, but is the fact that, like, you're looking, and you can't see it, and then you can't really, you don't really notice when all of a sudden you can see it, but all of a sudden you can, right? Because yep. of the, the water visibility. Yep. It's light enough, but you can't see the, the particles in the water. Mm-hmm. Well, when you dive in a lake is almost always horrible visibility like you can't see hardly anything and Mm -hmm. so when i'm diving it's always really eerie because it's like it's cold everything just looks dead you know there's no sound (laughs) at all they're like down trees you can see like web looking like it Uh just looks dead and you're swimming and you look and even though you looked to the left three seconds prior you look to the left and there's stuff right in your face yep. and that happened to me one time where i did that and there was the biggest snapping turtle i've ever seen <laughs> in my life like its head was definitely as big as my fist yep. and it was like right in my face and i just like stopped <laughs> I was like, oh no, what do I do? And then I just like slowly back paddled until I couldn't see it anymore and then just beeline the opposite way. Have you ran into a lot of those? I've had a couple snappers and, you know, talking about the one as big as your your hand, uh, we were up in Niagara this last summer. Uh, we got found like 500 bottles in this one spot and it would clean up a lot of trash rubber. But I had a bottle in my hand and I seen another bottle and, you know, all the rocks, they kind of blend in and they have like a green moss on them. I went to reach for this other bottle and all of a sudden I realized I was only about three, four inches from the head of a snapping turtle. Oh, it was just God. chilling there. It's it's uh, shell kind of blended in with the rocks. But he just stood there. I mean, I, I pulled back really fast and it yeah. scared me. Um, I had another time uh, when I was under uh, the edge of a bridge, bridge and the pilings that come down and I was picking up trash, bottles, cans, whatever. And I seen like this kind of faint white thing in the dark of the bridge there and went to reach for it all of a sudden. It was a snapper. Just took off. Went that way, I went that way, and it's just like, oh, that was close. Yeah, yeah, we don't have sharks or anything, but we definitely have stuff that's scary. Mm -hmm. What do you think is scarier, or do you not feel scared anymore? Do you think Um, diving in a lake with low visibility is scarier, or do you think diving in the ocean is? Well, the thing is, I I dive in a lot of rivers for my cleanups, so the visibility is horrible, especially in the Fox River. Yeah. So sometimes I can only see six inches. I got my face right at the bottom looking for like a bright lure or some kind of coloring right, yeah. so I can grab it. And then you got all the line that you're pulling up. But I usually fish, face uh, up current with my elbows to the side because there's sturgeon in there. Oh. And so you get like some of these sturgeon are like 150 pounds and they're longer than you. Yeah. So when you have low vis and you can't see anything over here, all of a sudden you just feel something bump your arm and it moves your whole body. It's like, ooh. Yeah. Well, and then it's gone before you can see it. <laughs> yeah. Too, right. Yeah, you can't see it anyway. I've had other times where it sure. come right past my head, and all of a sudden you just see this big tail, and it just swoops really fast. And one time I hit my camera, my GoPro, and that, that kind of scared me. Wild. Okay. Well, let's take <laughs> this. I'm, we're just going down awesome stories, which I love. But let's take it back a little bit further. So, have you always been an angler? Like, has fishing and like being on the lake always been something that was really important to you from way back when you were water skiing? Yep. I grew up on lakes and rivers. Um, went been to the ocean a few times, uh, lived in Pensacola, uh, Florida. Pensacola, Florida for a year, but yeah, we, we grew up fishing, canoeing, um, boating, yeah. always going to beaches and hanging out, doing picnics. So I really love the water yeah. and I, you know, my dad, dad taught me how to swim younger and, um, you know, all my siblings swam and I would just like to enjoy the water a lot. Did you ever go snorkeling and stuff back then? 
Um, you know, as a kid, I probably tried it a few times, but I think when I was in my late teens, 14, we went to the Bahamas yeah. and, uh, then did a little, little, uh, scuba diving out there or not scuba diving, a little snorkeling, snorkeling out there. Yeah. And then, you know, 18, 19, I did a little bit in Florida Yeah. and then, uh, I never really got back into it until my, um, thirties. Yeah. Well, simply because you wanted to go get your lure, right? Yep. <laughs> Do you remember the, the first time that you went in and got one? Because I know like you snag on something and people like canoe over mm -hmm. and try to like reach in. But do you, can you recall the story the first time you actually got out of a boat? Oh, the first time look, look for lures. I was just uh, over here, Marinette between the library and Stevenson Island and it's pretty shallow in there. So, um, I was just kind of waiting, um, with a, with some waders on and I had a golf ball retriever. So I was, you know, I could see the lure down there. You, you hook it, grab it. And I only had like a little plastic container and you filled it up in like 10 minutes. Oh, sure. So then I decided once the water warmed up, I'm like, well, I know how to swim and it's shallow out here. I'll get a mask, some shoes and a little board that I can put the lures on. And I got a bunch and I just kept doing it over and over again and kept getting more and more. Yeah. People are noticing they're walking over the walk bridge and they're like, whoa, that's a lot of lures. Yeah, sure. So at first it was more so about saving the lures and like treasure hunting. Yep. At what point did you start feeling guilty about like, I actually have to pick up all the garbage too? Good point. Uh, uh, good question. <laughs> I, uh, when I, once I started realizing like all the cans in there, the beer bottles, um, the soda cans and like all the line, it's endless. Yeah. Man. It's just like, like, I gotta get, I gotta clean this stuff up. Cause like, uh, it's just, it's not supposed to be here. Um, it, you know, people, kids like to swim in here sometimes they're going to cut their feet, uh, whatever. So I ended up getting a little, uh, like a plastic container. I put on my boogie board so I could throw all that stuff in there. It wouldn't fly out. And then, um, after a while I got myself a kayak yeah. and then I got another kayak donated from, a, um, Windrose North Outdoors in Menominee here, they, they donated to help me clean up. And then I started grabbing anchors and bicycles and tires, rims, yeah. uh, brake parts, uh, alternators, whatever's down there. Sure. Yeah. But it totally takes like, it doesn't make it not fun, but like I've seen a lot of cans diving, mm -hmm. but I haven't picked them up because it's like, well, I got, you know, 30 more minutes or however long I'm going to be underneath the water. And you like, I, for real, you know this, but most people don't realize every lake not just the ones by big cities mm -hmm. everyone is full of beer cans yes and they're everywhere we're really quick like I, when i first started diving i would pick them up but it would be immediately that i got four in my hand and i'm like well i'm supposed yeah. to dive 40 more minutes i can't <laughs> like and i'm not gonna go resurface because i don't have a thing to put them in mm -hmm. so i end up just leaving them because i'm like this is just amasses it immediately it takes I, I didn't go into like I didn't go diving with the intent of this was me picking up garbage today. I wanted to go dive around, but mm -hmm. I felt I do still every time feel really guilty about not picking up. But it's like endless. It is, and that's, that's one of my my mission is to you know not leave that stuff down there. Take every ounce of line that I see when I yeah. when I'm grabbing lures. I'm not just cutting the line off the lures to grab the lure. I'm like pulling all the line, all the the braid line, the mono. Um, and when you're pulling on it, all of a sudden you'll see a couple crayfish come flying by that are tangled up in their legs, mud puppies that are tangled up. Um, just freed a fish the other day that was uh, snagged up on some hooks, lying, and it was stuck to a log. But it's like, uh, I can't leave it. And there's a lot of, uh, there's different uh, influencers that just go out and do treasure hunting. Right. And they yeah. leave all the all the junk down there. But like I encourage people, hey, if you're going to go out there to grab the good stuff, you got to grab the bad stuff too. Yeah. It just becomes a much bigger job, which mm -hmm. obviously now you're doing it for a living. So like it's mm -hmm. a little bit more like it's it's always justifiable, but it's more justifiable as far as like you have more time to put into it. So, you know, of course, plus you can create content based around it. Like yes. if you were only only treasure hunting, you wouldn't be building your social media to be the story of the person you are. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't be a career in the same kind of way. So you can justify it. Yep. But if somebody can realistically, they only have one tank. They're only going one dive this whole weekend. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to be like, OK. Uh, my dive's going to end up being limited to just this and I'm going up like it takes yeah. it takes all of it. Anyways, can I give you a couple gifts? Sure. Dope, dude. Yeah. Not only did I drive here, but I brought you gifts. Look at me. I'm Santa. Nice. Minimum wage Tim's Coffee Co. That's for you. All right. I love coffee. Yeah. Tim's a buddy of mine over in Minneapolis. He mm -hmm. went to school in Eau Claire. He has this boutique coffee brand. Right now he's over in like India or something, which is pretty wild. Um, but anyways, we give away a bag of coffee to the guest and then also to somebody listening. So during this week that this episode comes out, all you have to do is be following Minimum Wage Tim on Instagram and then DM him the password for the week, which I'm setting right now. And let's just say it's Holy Diver. All right. And then awesome. I have chocolate for you, too. I love chocolate. Dude, this is the best chocolate. So Mayana Chocolate is from Spooner, Wisconsin, but it is they brand themselves as the best chocolate in the world. And I'm like, 
I, yes, this is like a sponsored post, but it really is the best chocolate I've ever had. Huh. It's like I, the first time I took a bite of it, it was like uh, you take the bite and you realize like everything stops. You're like, oh my God, I have to pay attention, like <laughs> yeah. close your eyes and you just like eat it. Just sitting, eating in silence because it's so good. Anyway, mm -hmm. so you can go to myoutofchocolate.com and use promo code PASSION for 25% off. But I hope you enjoy that. It, it looks really good. My favorite coffee. Banana. Or my favorite chocolate I've ever had. Monkey Bar Mini. Uh, banana rum, vanilla bean, marshmallow, 66% dark chocolate. Dude, yes. And melt my mouth. I know. I want. So my daughter got really, her favorite movie right now is the new Wonka movie. So I'm planning on going over to the factory and like bringing her to take her around and stuff. It'll be, cool. it'll be pretty dope. But speaking about sponsor stuff. So how did you start making this into a living? And was it something that was like a, a quick transition of like one contract changed everything and you did it full time? Was it something where it was like, oh, you started doing a little bit of exchange rate, like mm -hmm. somebody's providing you with gloves and but it's just product, you know, mm -hmm. how did that process work for you? So I was uh, I started this when I had a full time job doing underground electric. I was an operator. Uh, so we'd install under underground power, yeah. um, terminate transformers, meters, pedestals. I did that for like eight and a half, nine years. But the last couple of years, I started doing the diving, the, the video editing, recording, and then get my growing my channels. Um, and then it came to the point I had a sh shoulder surgery. You know, I've had three hernia surgeries before and like doing a construction work with having um, Renaud syndrome in, in your hands and your feet. What's Renaud syndrome? It's a, like a bad circulation in your, oh, in your okay, hands. Yeah. So they, they get cold really fast. And when you're working outside in like 10 degrees, zero degree weather. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're cold within the first five minutes of the day. Then but you're, you're having that same problem. I'm so, yeah, but I can, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get out of the water and then right, it, you know, yeah. it comes back. But sure. I just said, Hey, this is enough of this. And, uh, I started building up my business to go full time. And uh, when I first started full time, January, 2023, I started booking uh, like a bunch of TV shows, um, news stations, radio shows, podcast. And so last year I was really busy and I got a lot more throughout the year. And then, um, you know, a different news channel will contact me when they see one of my videos go viral. Or if I help somebody, um, you know, I find some kind of random property like dog tags or something like that. And then they'll reach out and say, hey, we see that you did this and you got it back to the owner. Can we do a story on it? Right. Stolen jewelry. Um, that was one of my best finds, too. I was able to get back to the owner with some um, laminated obituaries. Oh, wow. So that was really cool. Um, but no, I just kept, uh, you know, networking, marketing, um, promoting other businesses, um, doing angler interviews, people that were down here fishing. I would interview them so that they could kind of get the spotlight and wherever they're from, from the people could see that they're here fishing and, yeah. you know, having a good time. What was the first time that you got paid or got something for free? What was that? Um, let's see here. You know, people were sending me like clothes, like, um, was it a Wisconsin clothing company? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Corey, yeah. Corey, yeah. So we, we kind of swapped clothes. Like I kind of wore stuff, did a video opening all the stuff and I sent him some of my stuff too. So it was kind of like more of a networking thing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I got a bunch of other stuff like, uh, line cutters. I work with line cutters up over here. Yeah. Um, they send me free products to help me when I'm underwater yeah, to sure. help cut fishing line. Uh, most of the time I'm grabbing all the line out anyway, so I'm not really cutting it too much except for I'm like setting crayfish free or mud puppies yeah. or fish that are all tangled up in line. But I, I mean, I do use it quite often and uh, yeah, they even, they're going to send me a bunch of them with my logo on them and they oh, say, cool. do whatever you want with them. So yeah, they get, then I got their logo on my arm and you know, when I'm using their product, you can see it in the video. Yeah, sure. So I, yeah, definitely a lifesaver. Um, but I've got players on me and I've got an extra knife and I got the line cutters. So it's like, I always have the tools right on my chest at my you disposal. Have a whole utility belt. <laughs> yeah. So I, were you, were you making enough money before you quit your job that you knew like you'd be okay? Or did you have like some savings set aside where you're like, if, as long as over the next three months I make mm -hmm. enough money, then this is the switch. So it, uh, with uh, the beginning of the year, the springtime, we have the spring walleye run. Okay. And so I, the last couple of years have been building on my clientele and stuff. People is that a walk, fishing contest or what is it? Oh, the walleye run is just when the walleye come up out of the, out of the bay and they come up to the rivers and they, they can only go as far as the dam. Oh, so people are fishing okay. for trout and walleye sure. and whatever else. Yeah. But, uh, I just started selling down at the river a couple of years ago and, uh, it's just been what? growing fishing lures. The ones um, that you were finding and you, did you like clean them off or? Yep. Clean them up. If they need new hooks, put new hooks on them. Then we, uh, this year we started bagging them up individually, but we used to have them just in like a bunch of tackle trays organized. But uh, as we're growing, we're trying to make it neater. Yeah, I'll show you later the peg boards out in my toy hauler there. But uh, yeah, started with a table um, by the river. Then I got some canopies. And the last couple of years, I, I bought a toy hauler to help me sell um, in, out by the river there. And uh, it's just, uh, that's the time of the year where I make the most money. And it kind of sets me, you know, 
pay, helps me pay bills and stuff. But this year, I've been getting uh, been getting sponsored. Um, most recently, uh, Nicolay Law. Yeah. I'm trying to get you know some other big sponsors on board too. I'm also do a, a, a kind of like some sponsorship funding for the summer tour I'm going on. Uh, I'll be traveling across the Midwest for three months so that people can come help me clean up or they can come die with me. And then it also like the money I'm raising will help pay for fuel, for lodging, for uh, garbage disposal, for equipment. Go through a lot of gloves. Yeah. For uh, for air tank refills. So a lot of a lot of great people out there who appreciate what we're doing, and they uh, they're trying to help out the yeah. way they can. Don't you? I I struggle with this a little bit too, of when you do something that you know it like helps people, you know it benefits people. You didn't do it for money in the first place. Mm-hmm. Do you feel really uncomfortable asking for money? Because I definitely do. But like, I deserve to make a decent. Like, I deserve to be able to pay my bills. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I work really hard. But I like, I feel just guilty. Like, so I don't like asking for money, even though I know I should. Very much. You know, I'm. I like. I'm a hard worker all my life. Grew up on a farm. Worked a lot of factories. Got a degree in law enforcement. So, I like. I I like working for my money. But there were so many people reaching out to me like, hey, how can we support you? You know, how can we can we donate somewhere? And I was getting a lot of people asked that. So I finally made like, um, you know, my PayPal on my website. They can donate. Um, I have Venmo, um, which is at the diver dot com at the diver dot com is yeah, my okay. website. People can donate through PayPal or Venmo. Venmo is at the diver. PayPal is Bieber's underwater recovery at Gmail dot com. But uh, it's like people just send money and like I just I keep track of it and I have a, a tier um, like a sponsor tiers for for the summer tour, and just got a lot of people on there, and they want to help support me. Sure. Uh, and you know, I've got Sal and Jay coming with me to help clean up too. Cool. And uh, it also it just helps me keep going. Yeah. So yeah, well, because you have to make money. Like like I said, mm-hmm. that's the hard part, right? Is people you could do it for free, but the thing is, if you were doing it for free exclusively for free, then you would eventually have to like still have a different job to pay for it. And then you yep. wouldn't be able to do as much yep, because time. so much of that goes into it. How many hours per day, like when you were working full time, mm-hmm. I'm sure it progressed, but like how many hours per day, what was going into it on as it, when it was just a side thing. So, you know, I'd work, I'd be gone 12 hours a day at my normal job, Monday through Friday. 12 hour days 12 like you know i leave here to go to my job yeah. work and then you got to drive home so i was like 12 hours there and then i'd come home and start editing videos or I'd go for a dive on the weekends i'd dive all the time just to kind of start building everything up uh but then i'm like still like work for myself i work seven days a week you know about 12 hours a day right. um whether it be diving video editing um doing uh, public speaking meet and greets uh just uh doing donations or going to events Um, so it's been really busy. I really don't get time off. Um, but next week I'm going to Florida for a week. That's my first vacation in like four or five years. Yeah. Well, it's hard because (laughs) like when the things you enjoy that would be your hobby are your career, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's hard to like stop because you know that there's more to be done always. Like you could be doing more and you do like it, but it is like really exhausting. So diving, like you're not supposed to dive alone realistically. Mm -hmm. Like when you get patty certified, they Mm -hmm. tell you that. Um, I dive alone I, because who there's nobody to dive with me up at my cabin. So yep. like, I'm just careful, but I'm assuming you must have to dive alone all the time. Most of the time uh, I do dive alone, but you know, you got Sal and Jay, he'll dive with me too. Um, when it warms up, he doesn't yeah. have the warmer gear like I have, but, uh, it's like, and Silent uh, Jay is like another influencer that does cleanup or like, who, is he's it a, just a friend he's here? Best friend of mine. Um, he's been helping me for the last couple of years and uh, you know, we travel around together. Um, okay, cool. So I have an awesome guy. We used to work together at Marinette Marine. Um, is he the one who takes most of the videos of you? Uh, I take a lot of my own video, but you know, he'll hold the camera once yeah, in a sure. while. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I guess cause you do a lot of GoPro stuff. Yeah. Go- yeah. Okay. But no, we, uh, we go all over the place and just trying to think here what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> I asked what, what is his role? Oh like, yeah. So yeah. He, yeah, he helps, you know, it helps me process like the bottles and then he helps me with the lures and, uh, helps wash them, uh, change the hooks out, bag them up, get ready to resale. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we just, I, I, for diving alone in the rivers here, a lot of times if somebody was with you, you can't see them a couple of feet away right. anyway. And it's shallow. If you have an issue with your gear, you can either just stand up or you just pop up 10 feet. Yeah. So, and, yeah. But what about when you're diving in a river? Cause it's not like, you, how do you tell, how can you tell spatially where you even are? Like how far downstream you would have gone? I know realistically, oh. like you want to start upstream. So that way you come down and you get yeah. out, but it's not like there's 
a, there's not like a finish line where you know you pass this thing okay mm-hmm. now i need to get up so i always i come up and down um a lot to you know when you're, you're throwing stuff you're grabbing off the bottom throw it in your kayak or your board so you can always get a reference you know a bridge or what anything around you yeah okay. so and a lot of times i'm always facing up river um so that i'm not kicking up uh debris from the bottom then you can't see anything yeah okay so a lot of times it's like uh, you just from coming up and down you know one day i got 27 anchors in my kayak it's a two-hour dive but uh yeah he's keep getting reference from like power poles on shore or trees or the, the land there yeah okay do you like tie a rope or how does how does your canoe stay next to you so i have a, a anchor on my kayak and with the rope of course so i just have my hand you know as i'm on the bottom and just bring it with me oh so you're hold like in one hand you're holding the mm-hmm. wow okay but i yeah. feel like that's a lot to carry when you're trying to like cut other lures and stuff and you're like trying to be aware of the fact you have a camera on but then yeah. you're also not trying to get tangled in things you just set it down it'll stay there i know? guess so have you ever been tangled in anything real bad or not really i get a lot of line that wraps around like my uh, hoses or my my the sides of my fins where they connect together where you snap it on there yeah okay. um so i get a lot that happens a lot so you just got to make sure you're aware of it and you cut it right away before it rubs back and forth and wrecks your hoses or your, or your gear yeah sure what about getting stuck like i know you go through a lot of gloves mm-hmm. what's the worst uh hook that you've gotten in your hand i gotta think you've gotten <laughs> them like actually stuck in before right no i haven't passed the barb except for once while i was cleaning them uh, right on the table here where we're on right now not even diving not even diving <laughs> so my gloves are pretty thick they're five mil okay. so you know the hook can go in there you know a quarter inch and barely just touch my hand i suppose so, so yeah. that helps a lot but i am pulling them out a lot you know ripping my gloves up and i have a scooper that i can put stuff in but a lot of the floating lures will pop up out of the scooper right. so it's i kind of i tried a lot, a lot of different ways i like the way i just do it put them in my hand even if i gotta shake them off my hand for a couple seconds when i yeah. put them in there um, but i like that but it's like uh, the only time i actually went through my i went right through my thumb i was trying to put a hook on a jigging wrap and when i was trying to pressure it on it slipped and then there's there's like two op, uh, opposing hooks on the jigging wrap and a treble hook on the bottom and one of them went through my thumb and came out above my thumbnail and I, I just had to, you know, clip the clip the I, one yeah, end the off out, yeah. the barbell, and then just pull it all backwards. Do I, but a lot of the a lot of the stuff's rusted underneath the water, is it not? Um, so isn't it dangerous even if it pierces your skin at all? So this time of year, when the water's still cold, um, I learned that uh, the lures, uh, the the hooks, will stay pretty good for you know a month, two months. But then once it starts uh, getting warm, then that rust starts forming on there. Yeah, then, but the ones that have been there multiple years, the rust doesn't go away, does it? Um, the hooks will rust off and stuff, okay. um, but like a lot of the parts, like the, the the split rings are stainless steel. Some of the older lures are copper uh, yeah. split rings. So um, don't find too many bad split rings. Sure. But we've got extra replacements, extra hooks. I, I order thousands of hooks every year. I feel like you need to have your own like pro model glove come out that like can't be pierced. You know what I mean? Not steel toes, obviously, because mm-hmm. it have to be flexible. But there's got to be other materials better than the like neoprene, mm-hmm. like gloves. And I, I, someone else mentioned that they mentioned Kevlar gloves. Yeah, it's like finely stitched metal, whatever. But yeah. I actually bought some of those, and it's worse than the other gloves because of the finely stitched Kevlar. The hooks are still the barbs are still getting hooked in them, and you're trying to pull them out. Oh yeah, and then you can't just rip them out because yeah. they get totally stuck. Yep. Dang, dude. I didn't even think about that. What about editing with all of that? I feel like like people don't realize when you do something like what you do, mm-hmm. there's so many different like hats that you have to wear. And it sounds great to like go diving, but <laughs> this is random. But when I was in Scotland, this is a, a quick side story. When I was in Scotland, I went to Loch Ness mm-hmm. and they were, the tour person was telling us about how this really rich guy bought a submarine thinking he's going to take people like for a bunch of money to go look for Nessie underwater. And it's like <laughs> black that like, is, oh. there's no visibility. It's, it's horrible. It's just like black, black. Well, mm. it's a great idea to be like, Oh, let me create videos of like picking stuff up. Mm. Dude, you can't really see like I, on your videos and I'm not yeah. saying you're doing it wrong at all, but that's just what the visibility is yep. like. So it what is. have you like, that's a challenge initially when you're starting to make the videos, mm-hmm. but like, is there, have you figured out any tips or tricks to how to do it so that way it's more visible or looks better yeah. on camera? Yeah. So what I've learned is to help it make it look better. I just, uh, uh, this time of year, actually the Menominee River right here is really clear. Fox River is horrible. I won't dive in there probably this year, but there's so many other, other rip places to go to. But um, I just try to get it from when I'm, when I'm picking up lures to get it from when I'm, when I'm picking it off the ground and transferring it to my hand. So that it's just a quick like 0.8 seconds or one second just you right. know, transfer. Because once you do that, the muck just... 
yeah, goes. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, in some places. But then I try to, like, after I get a handful of lures, I try to show it, me throwing them on my basket so people can see where I'm at so they can kind of reference if they fish around here. They can be like, okay, that was my lure. That's the same exact one I lost. I was fishing there. Yeah. I can see where I got snagged on. I lost my lure. And most of the time, it's just a rock to get snagged on. And uh, once they break the line, the lure will go flying back like a foot or two, and it's just sitting in the middle of nowhere. Like, So I get accused a lot. Like, there's no way these things aren't even snagged. You're just picking them off the flat bottom. Yeah, there's so <laughs> many people. Yeah, dude, there's so many people that are like that. And that, I mean, yeah, whatever. How do you keep it interesting, though, as far as content goes? Because when you make videos and stuff, like people will get bored if you post the same stuff, mm-hmm. right? And right now, you're not so much like, look at this treasure. You're more so like, look at the quantity of what I'm taking out. Mm-hmm. But even so, that's relatively repetitive. Yep. right so like how do you keep it interesting for one for yourself but like what's your strategy as far as like video content for how do you like capture people great question um i have been doing like i said earlier the angler interviews where you need to just go down by the river and people are fishing everywhere you just, say, you just talk to them yeah I say hey you mind if you mind, mind being on my channel for an interview and you know mostly everybody's like yeah i love your love your work and oh, love cool. what you do and so i do those a couple times a year i also do like uh i'll, I'll strap a gopro on my chest or my head and i'll just do a bank cleanup picking up fishing line trash make it kind of a fast-paced video yeah. a lot of people like seeing that are you know doing giveaways are just uh, lately it's been with this barbie doll that i sold for one thousand two hundred twenty five dollars on ebay and then the whole story after that now now having a girlfriend and like mixing my whole life with her life and doing all this stuff together oh god so, let me hear the story of the barbie i know like it's been in the newspaper and it's been it's a whole thing so like that yeah tell a story all right so i was just in the in the wolf river in shawana wisconsin doing a, a normal cleanup like i always do i'm gonna grab this thing for you all right while you tell the story there's a newspaper paper article underneath the two there so yeah I, um i was just picking up beer cans and all kinds of other junk and you know picking up lion lures and uh I found this Barbie doll hanging out of the rocks. I think it might have been her feet hanging out because they seem to be the cleanest. Um, but grabbed it, and I was all excited. It was the first Barbie I found underwater, and it just looks dirty and trashy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then um, ended up uh, bringing it home, made the video with it. And then um, a friend of mine, Christy um, Barlament, she she owns a city deck landing in, in Green Bay, and they have a radio station, all that stuff. She's like, oh, you should sell that Barbie. And I'm like, who's going to want to buy that thing? Yeah. So I ended up, and her and a couple other people said, hey, you should sell it. So I put it on my website, like, well, what the heck? You know, I'll do it as like a fundraiser thing to help me pay for my uh, traveling expenses and my cleanup stuff. So I put 100 bucks on my website, had it on there for a couple of days. I advertised my Facebook that was on there, had all these laughs and comments. And um, someone reached out to me and said, hey, you should put that on eBay. And I was I'm not really an eBayer, so... Ended up putting on eBay, I, then I put $100 as a starting bid for a week, and then a, another person reached out and said, hey, you should start it at $0.99, cents, and then people start you know, bidding small. So and it was an auction like up. that, yeah. So within a day after chain it's at $0.99, cents, it got over $100 in a day, and then um, Christy started bidding on it, Parliament that wanted to buy it at first, and then uh, Ryan Rubel from meanwhile wisconsin he yeah. started bidding on it oh, and he, he started calling it crandon barbie <laughs> <laughs> uh, smells like a uh, beer racing fuel and freedom oh god uh, that he mentioned it a couple times got a lot of likes and laughs uh, and then uh, another lady lucy she uh she started bidding on it too and uh the day before the, the, it was about to end um channel 12 got a, from ryanlander got a hold of me and said hey we'd love to come down and do a news story so they came and did a news story and by then it was like at 500 or 600 bucks or something like that and uh so they did the story they showed it on air that night and then um um yeah i watched the show i was all excited that the barbie made the news and then uh next morning i woke up channel five news from green bay contacted me said hey we want to come up and cover this while it's closing whatever so they come on up so they within an hour they're up here um they caught the end of the auction and they got some footage did an interview and then I got uh, notified by Channel 12, the one who did the story the night before, like, hey, CNN said that they want your story. <laughs> and then, uh, but I think, I don't know if they subcontracted it out through what other uh, news channels, okay. but it ended up going, you know, Texas, Florida, Idaho, Kansas, like people from all over saying, oh, we saw this, this story down here. So it was pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, it ended up closing at like $1,225. Oh, Christy God. Barliament won the last, the end of the bidding there. Um, but then she's, uh, we ended, it was her birthday that night. So we ended up delivering it to her for her birthday in Green Bay. 
Um, we brought her some more, you know, I bought her another mermaid, a uh, mermaid Barbie from a, a store and we bought her some other stuff. Um, had a couple drinks, had some food, um, just had a good time, met some of her friends and, uh, not soon after that we were dating. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so yeah, she not only won the Barbie, but she kind of won me over too. Wow. And matchmaker I, Barbie. So that Barbie <laughs> isn't even like a specific special model or anything it's just no, a barbie it just i feel like bar you must find more than one barbie down there that's, that's the first one a 1993 mattel Inc. have you seen any i feel like that wouldn't be that rare of a thing to find I, well i mean i've never seen one but i'm just saying like as far as like random toys or other things like um, that surprises me that that was the first one that somebody's ever found now it's gonna yeah. be like my life mission to find another barbie. yeah i mean it's it's trash it's <laughs> like that sand is still falling out of its hair this yeah. thing has been to like so many places uh like bars and restaurants and everywhere like uh christy uh, everybody's seen the story they're always asking her aren't you that barbie girl like <laughs> wolf river barbie or cranon barbie and she'll like whip it out of her purse she's like yeah it's right here and now you got it back anyway well yeah she was uh we, we went to a, we went to an event the other night dueling piano show yeah uh, where they playing they were playing songs and we were just laughing and eating and drinking or whatever and they ended up playing the barbie doll song and she actually brought these to the show and oh, people God. were coming up to her asking her for pictures and stuff uh, yeah, yeah. and she'd whip them out but they played the barbie barbie song whatever and we were up on stage <laughs> with these dolls I just posted a video of it. I was kind of embarrassed, but you know, I was trying to you know throw yeah. in some extra spice in my channel. Yeah. But uh, put those on there. We're up there dancing and stuff, and everybody's laughing and clapping. Um, but yeah, even the Pesco Times did a story recently uh, with you know there she is when I first <laughs> found it, and they kind of talk about you know my goal, my mission, and stuff, and what I've been doing. And and she got uh, I think the Green Bay Press Gazette supposed to be getting a hold of me for a story. Oh God! And uh, we got That's awesome. like six or seven professional photo shoots. Oh, like, oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming up. Yeah, it's just it just blew my mind. It's like over a dirty, stinky Barbie like this thing. It's like, but it, there's more of the more of the story, of course. Yeah, sure. uh, now that I mean, we're seeing each other and stuff, and yeah, it's like uh, like I told you earlier, I've been divorced twice, so like I'm really on a mission to keep doing what I'm doing and not get distracted, but. I'm distracted now. <laughs> <laughs> Barbie did it to you. That's yeah. uh, that's awesome. So thank you, Barbie. <laughs> now you got some other stuff coming up, right? Like you did, you recorded some TV things, right? Mm -hmm. Are you you might be having a TV show come so, out? Tell me what's going on. So a couple of years ago, I got co contacted by a, a show um, for this fall, 2024. Um, they contacted me. It's a big, bigger show. I don't want to mention right now, but they said, "Hey, you want to be in an episode um, in August of 2024?" And this is like. 21 or 2021 22 and i'm like wow it's a long ways away yeah like yeah it's a big show and we try to plan it all out so i got that to look forward to i had a, a, a producer for uh, bill shirk okay from minnesota he contacted me last year we did um he, they came and recorded for the day and i think they got enough footage to do two episodes and that's supposed to air either this month or next month and it's like a whole year gone by already sure yeah um i also got contacted by the producer that already has a um, a show on um, on a big network. He contacted me, wanted to to do my own show, and uh, that that was like a year ago. And it's kind of been dwindling down. Like I haven't heard much back about it. I was all excited when someone right. a producer calls you, says, "Hey, we want to do a show about what you do and stuff." People always promise you the world, yeah. So I just learned like I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. You know, other things are happening that are really cool and exciting. I'm not gonna focus on you know try to get a show. If they really want me to to have my own show, I'll let them pursue right. me. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like, it's not a bad thing to reach out to sponsors and to, like, in order to get things lined up, a lot of times you have to reach out to people. Like, mm -hmm. people, I, people don't just, like, I mean, people do hit me up to find the show, but generally speaking, it's not people hitting me up going, Chris, please, like, knocking on my door, mm -hmm. interview me. Most of the interviews I do, I'm always eyes and ears open, like, who would be a cool interview? And then all of a sudden, I saw, like I said, off mic, I think when Nicolay Law posted, like, they were partnering with you, of all people for me to discover you through, yeah. that's how I saw it. And I was like, what? A scuba diver who does this? What? Who's the cool awesome. and then i emailed you like right that day and got a message back but like that's how a lot of this stuff has to line up however mm -hmm. when you're desperate for something especially if you want it to be something that actually pays you anything like yeah. they know that you're desperate in which case like you're not going to get paid it's better to yeah. just like keep doing you know what i mean it's better to just keep doing what you're doing how come you don't just do it i mean i guess you kind of are with your youtube channel anyways but how come you don't just try to put together a team to do a show on something like that because tv shows are great mm -hmm. but media definitely is changing where like there's youtube channels mr beast would be like an mm -hmm. example right that like 
that gets way more views and can make way more money than a yeah. TV show on this channel. And though. you're not going through all the you know, all the other stuff that you got to go through for a TV right. channel, networks, and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I could do that, but it, like as I'm growing right now, I can't afford to pay for an editor, for a producer, for all the extra stuff that I would need right. um, to do this. So, like, I'm doing all – I I record the videos, I do the dives. Um, I, me and Jay uh, clean up the lures and stuff, the bot, scrub bottles that we find. I'm doing PR public speaking, uh, traveling, like all kinds of stuff. Like I make my own merch. Oh, okay. Um, so, I, and I need to get back on that. Sell the, sell my own lures. Um, just, I do so many things and it's like overwhelming, but someday, you know, I, I need like two or three employees to help give me more time to go do, go travel dive. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to sleep at night. It's yeah. hard to like just lay there and say, okay, shut down your brain, go to bed. Um, and you start coming up with like, ideas and you're like, you're kind of still, um, and it's hard to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I think the best time for me to relax is being underwater. There's no phone, there's no social media, you know, it's just you, the fish and God, and you're just underwater picking up stuff. You're seeing cool stuff. You're feeding, um, bass, crayfish, yeah. you're seeing sturgeon, walleye, trout. Yeah. There's nothing to interrupt you. I mean, like that's how I am when I paint murals. Hmm. That's what, I mean, when I go camping is the other one. Cause that I truly, I purposely go camping where I don't have cell phone reception and then no one can bother me. Like that's how I recharge. But, nice. but otherwise, like as far as work goes, like this is fun. This is great. I definitely wouldn't do it if it wasn't something I just genuinely really like doing. Like mm -hmm. I do make a living, but still murals, which I do get paid for that too, I suppose. But still it's like when I can put music on a little speaker, or even if I just have headphones on and I know for the next well, two to six hours, I can't really respond to anything, mm -hmm. you know, because I got paint on my hands. Like, I'm not trying yeah. to grab my phone. You know what I mean? So, yep. like, I know that I'm not really going to be interrupted and I'm just like in my zone having a good time. That's like, I'm so excited to be getting to that season of the year again. Yeah. Like, I got, uh, I got to paint, start painting one. I think I'm supposed to be painting it May 5th. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm supposed to try to finish it May 5th, meaning I'm going to be painting that coming up real soon. And then I got another one on the 11th that I have oh. to do. And these aren't like one day projects either. Like they take a little bit of time and some other ones in the work. So, but mm -hmm. the problem with me is now that I've been doing so much on YouTube, like I started going heavy, heavy into that in November that like editing all the clips, doing all that type of stuff. YouTube has made the show take three times as much time as it used to. I'm not exaggerating. Mm. It takes way, way, way more time. Yeah. So I, I'm trying to figure out the balance of now that I'm like once mural stuff comes up, how am I still going to be able to keep up with both to the level that I have? Right. Because exactly. as you grow, like you learn tips and tricks on how to make this thing a little bit quicker. Right. Yeah. So like yeah. with my YouTube shorts, I've learned how to like have a template. So that way the hashtags for each ones that are for one episode anyways mm -hmm. i'm pretty much just copy paste boom those are all there yep so i kind of like learned a couple little things but i'm still i'm not going to be able to keep up for yourself what are the th what has been the most helpful thing you've learned recently um how to say no <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about earlier about people want to send you stuff all the time and oh we'll, we'll uh we'll give you this free product if you make a video for us or um and it's like oh I, I don't need a product i need i need to get paid so i can keep going you know grow right. um also with uh people want you to travel um, they want you to drive three, four hours to go do a meet and greet, or they want you to, to do the radio show or a podcast. See, today you came here, you blessed me by coming here. So, <laughs> yeah. but it's like that all costs money. You're losing time from your traveling, the fuel costs, you got to buy food. Sometimes you got to stay overnight somewhere and it all adds up. So it's yeah. like, I can't afford to do it for free. And, and like, I don't need, I already got enough publicity. Like I don't need to go and try to right. gain, you know, maybe a hundred more followers. I can just post one video and sure. do that from home so right yeah um but no it's just uh, learning how to say no and like uh, another thing is like this is a time you were making so much content you can't keep up right like you got something really cool that happened but the next day you got another really cool thing to happen and you're like okay i only have time to edit for six or seven hours today which one should i pick but then you go and dive again now you got more content uh so by by the end of the year i'm like 25 30 videos behind for the year so this winter, I, I was just sitting editing as much as I could. Yeah. Um, instead of going on vacation in Florida, which I can't afford that yet, but I would just be sitting at my desk, um, not like sit, not like sitting in my chair all day, but I had to do it to get content out. Sure. But the problem is, right, you're going to end up going to Florida, and then there's going to be the temptation of like, but this would be really good for my channel I know. to be the Wisconsin guy down in the ocean doing this now. And like, it's it's hard to ever like fully shut down. You said mm -hmm. you're getting better at saying no. How do you... How, 
how do you get better at saying no? Because the problem for me is I don't like offending people, Mm -hmm. right? Like I know what my value is or what I believe my value to be is. But the problem is most of the time, somebody, the other party overvalues themselves or even if they're not overvaluing whatever, but Mm -hmm. what they think their value is versus what you think your value is, all of a sudden you're both at 60%. That's not the same. We're not 50, 50 here, Mm -hmm. you know, because of this reason, that reason, whatever. It's really hard to tell someone like, I, I'm not getting enough out of this because you can easily offend them. And a lot of times people do take offense to it. And you're like, dude, I'm not trying to be a jerk at all, but you approached me. Yeah. Like you, you put the ball in my part. Like I, I struggle with it, which is why I'm asking you, Mm -hmm. how do you do it? No, you just gotta, you get a way, the way, uh, what the, what's best for you, I guess. Um, but also, you know, if I I made a lot of friends along the way here and like networking, you want to help each other out. You want to help them grow. They help you grow. You share each other's stuff. You comment on their stuff like it. And that's like with Ryan Rubel. Um, I met him up in Crandon, Wisconsin, during a uh, parade, and then we did like the the brush run. Had a fun weekend, made some good content. He came dive with me, and ever since then, we've been talking a lot. I asked him a lot of questions about his growth, you know, what I should do, and he's been very helpful, along with other ones too. But uh, you learn how to say no. It's like, okay, this they want me to come to an event. It's going to take this much time to, to go there to speak or do this. Then you got to drive home. It's like, so I'm going to lose like 10 hours out of my day. Right. It's like I could have been editing for 10 right. hours today or I could have been diving and, and, you know, getting a bunch of lures, cleaning up the, the waterways. Um, what so about you, people who don't take no for an answer? Um, Like uh, the girl that bought the Barbie doll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's but not, no, but I mean, he's like, not my girlfriend. <laughs> if, but if you say like, hey, I don't, you know, that financially, this doesn't make sense for me. But then they yeah. go, okay, well, what if we give you this much more money? And you're like, but it, yeah. it, you, we weren't close, though, financially. You know what I mean? Like, do you eventually just stop responding to people? Or do you try oh. to, like, have a resolution with everybody? Because that could be exhausting, I think. I do say, I'm sorry, I don't have time to do this. Or it doesn't yeah. fit my schedule. Um, I do have a really busy schedule. And if I do have extra time, it fills up, you know, with doing different appointments or meeting with other people. Yeah, sure. Um, but it's like, you just got to learn, you know. What, how, how will this help my channel grow? Um, are, are they, do this want to use me, my influence to get more followers for themselves? Obviously they want to, they want to grow too. Right. Yeah. But at, at what cost to you? Yeah. Well, it just has to be mutually beneficial, right? Yep. And that sometimes that's a financial situation. Sometimes that's an exposure situation. Sometimes it's something totally different, right? Like mm-hmm. having peers that are in the same industry. Like the thing is with what you do or with what I do, I guess there's a million podcasts, but still like what you do, there's not really anybody else. That's like your direct peer that does the same thing Mm -hmm. you know it's not like when you work at a store and you can call the manager of the the different location say okay what are you doing with this problem how are you handling this like everyone's different Mm -hmm. my show there's really nothing else in where i live that does what i do like not on like a similar playing field there's nothing close the closest thing i can think of would be like charlie Barron's show from milwaukee which isn't even really his main thing and he doesn't do most of his in person they're not the same cripes cast yeah yeah cripes cast yeah charlie's rad i'm not down talking him but i'm just saying like it's, it's a totally different thing so i struggle when i'm like trying to solve a problem there's nobody to ask so huh. like I like hanging out with the other people that are have grown like in, you know influencer numbers mm-hmm. or whatever but not from the standpoint of exclusively you have numbers it's more like you have achieved the goals that I'm trying to achieve or are working on similar things so you can relate yeah. you're a valuable resource from that standpoint even mm-hmm. if I'm never asking for you to do anything it's yeah. just like a what would you do in this situation you know what exactly. I mean and not everyone's going to be cool like that and it, you come across a lot of people whose egos are just like outrageous and you know that they're really selfish but there's yeah. a lot of people especially in Wisconsin Ryan Rubel being awesome. one of the just sweetest humans ever mm-hmm. that are really great resources but it, there's yeah he, a mixture. I, I've asked him so many questions and yeah, yeah text him or call him and he's always you know willing to help me i try to answer any questions that i have for him but uh yeah we've got some uh, stuff coming up here i can't i can't give a date but i'm in the talks uh, i have a date but i'm in the talks with uh charlie and ryan to come diving over here and marin up here and then i you know go for supper or something after still got to pick the restaurant yet but that's coming up really quick and uh we actually went me and silent jay went diving with uh, charlie barons in manitowoc last year oh cool had an awesome time i, I hooked him up with one of my cameras and i had a camera and we were just kind of, it was funny kind of joking back and forth in the video, editing and all. That yeah. was a long one to edit. <laughs> oh, I imagine, dude. Yeah, well, I feel like, because Ryan has gotten a bunch of the Wisconsin influencers together to like mm-hmm. do content together. Obviously, that's like that. Yep. I wonder how many of us, though, I'm just inviting myself right now, but I'm saying <laughs> I wonder how many, though, actually do dive. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if we put that out there and planned it for like something in the future, yeah. not saying Charlie or anybody specifically has to be involved, but like mm-hmm. that could be kind of cool content across anybody who's like a, a influencer in Wisconsin, which there's a lot yeah. of them and not just Wisconsin, like look at Minnesota and stuff too. Right. Yeah. Well, and then there's different age groups because like, you know, you and Ryan and Charlie are all in that same general age group mm-hmm. versus like Jaron and Wyatt, who I think I told you off mic that I interviewed both them. Mm-hmm. They're like 24 okay like they're way younger than we are (laughs) so it's like we got to learn some stuff from them and what works for them yeah i'm 42 and like as i'm getting older here it's like you wake up and your knee hurts or your neck hurts your back it's like i just woke up i didn't do anything wrong how weird is it though being in your age group because i have this and i'm 30 uh i'll be 34 um next month yeah Mm -hmm. be 30 is you forget what age you are not trying to play employ you just kind of forget but um people my age i feel like a lot of friends of mine back in the day and whatever don't understand why I do what I do. It's almost like with skateboarding where it's like, aren't you a little old for that? Like, I feel like that's the attitude I get from people relatively yep. often. Do you deal with that a lot? Well, you mentioned skateboarding. I used to skateboard too. I had my own skate park that I built, but uh, I, I still want to get out there and ride the ramps and do stuff. But yeah. the older you get, the longer it takes to heal. You twist your ankle, you bust your hip or you, you know elbow or something. Yeah. You're going to be hurting for a while. Yeah. So I can't chance that. Uh, I still love doing it though. But I know it's just been... Uh, kind of getting to know your limitations you know working out and stuff and uh you try to learn you know what you you should or shouldn't do what you can or can't yeah. um like today i was at the post office instead of taking the walkway down i jumped over the rail so <laughs> if i fall hit yeah. my hit my ankle or something or fall off that i'd want to be embarrassed because there's two people walking out too sure and then plus you hurt yourself but it's like i you just you learn you, you learn to make better choices you gotta try it sure. too you know, I like to go out and have beers yeah, a yeah, lot. Yeah. One, it helps me fall asleep easier. <laughs> True. So, so it shuts my brain down. But two, it's just nice to get away from, you know, the the, the office here. Um, but I still i am answering um, comments and, well, and, and messages the more, for the hours. Well, and the more you get, right? Like you're in a small town. Everyone then knows, right? So like yeah. everywhere you go, you kind of have to deal with that too. Yeah. And like everyone knows you. So I went to Walmart today. A couple people love your videos, this yeah, and that. Yeah. And the, the, love what you're doing. Thanks for cleaning up the environment post office everybody knows you yeah. either the workers or people it's coming cool in but it's exhausting it is nice and it's like uh it's just hard like if i go out around here um have a couple of beers it's it's nice to say hi to somebody and someone says i love your your channels and you say thanks for watching but then when after a while after a couple of beers then they're screaming in your ear for a half hour yeah and yeah, they just yeah. want to hang out and talk and it's like i just want to relax you know? right sure that's so. why you got to build your own sweet like garage area <laughs> yeah where it's just the bro cave where you have to invite people yep. it's going to be the exclusive at the diver club okay there well we <laughs> you gave me one story but i know you got other stories i always ask the same question at the end of every episode so hopefully you got one more really cool story when you do something that you're passionate about for a living such as cleaning up waterways in wisconsin diving which you're the only one <laughs> you get to have really unique experiences that uh make all the work worth it can you mm-hmm. share one with us so obviously I mentioned the, the jewelry earlier. Yeah. I found I was my local river here. Um, I was uh, diving, just clean up lures and line and stuff, trash. And I saw this uh, pillowcase in between these logs about seven feet deep and grabbed the pillowcase and I noticed a hard metal uh, box right there. And it, there's another little wooden box in there. So I was curious, of course, went to shore, took my gear off, started opening it up. First thing I noticed when I opened the metal box, there were some uh, laminated obituaries in there. And then I started seeing all this jewelry, like gold, silver, like none of it was rusted. And yeah. I was like, I was like, wow, man, this is like real jewelry. And I uh, looked up one of the pieces. It was like a black, um, uh, black lady charm with like gold earrings and red ruby on it. Looked up on eBay. Uh, it said some words on it. Looked it up. It was selling for like four hundred fifty to seven hundred dollars. Wow. It's from the '60s. And then I noticed all the other jewelry, jewelry like bracelets and um, cuffs, cufflinks, and all this other stuff. But uh, like, I made my video, and within a couple of days, my neighbor, who has now passed away, she said, "Hey, I know the people in the obituaries. I know who's tied to them. There's my friend Gary Edwards, and uh, she ended up giving him my phone number. He contacted me, and within like a week or two, he came over here, and like he said, Ed, all I want back are these obituaries. I personally laminated them. That's my wife, my mother, and uh, like all the jewelry was theirs." And he said they, they took my handgun, they took my the money out of the case, and if that's all you found, then you know that's all that's left. Right. But I'm like, Gary, it's all yours. You know, they're good good memories. You can have them all back. And he's like, but you found them. I'm like, but they're yours. Yeah. So it was nice. Uh, Channel 26 came and did a story on it, and it's just it that was like probably one of the first biggest blessings I was able to be to somebody by finding the property, 
right. finding the owner with the help from a neighbor. And it's just been awesome to do it ever since with, you know, finding someone's phone, getting it working, giving it back. Apple watches, I find a lot of those. Finding just random stuff. Yeah. Well, and you're literally the only person who could have done that. Nobody else is diving looking for anything. So you know it's mm-hmm. not like somebody else was going to find it and give or come across and give it to them. You're the only reason that happened at all. So it's cool. And, and it's nice being an, an inspiration to other people. Yeah. Um, like I just had some um, some really expensive uh, Gerber players over there. Someone left in the bank and another angler found them. And he said, hey, Ed, can you help me find the owner of this? I posted on my channel. And within like a day or two, the owner contacted me. Sure. And he's like, He's like, Ed, I can't believe you found my stuff. You know, my kids let watch your stuff, and they're they're all like, oh, what if Ed the Diver finds it? But I'm like, I didn't find it. Somebody else got sure, a hold of yeah. me, but I'm going to help get it back to you. So they're pretty excited about that. But it's cool just, like, hearing all the stories. I, you know, people make videos or, or memes about me when they're fishing. They're snagged. Also, they'll make a video posted on their social media. They're like, <laughs> Ed, Ed the Diver, I need your help here. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's only going to get bigger and bigger, especially once you get on TV. Yeah. Dude, thank you so much for having me. This was an absolute pleasure. And you said you're coming to Eau Claire. I'm not going to mm-hmm. let you not kick it with me when you come to Eau Claire. So, yeah, I'll expect to. I'll have uh, some extra gear. Do you have your own gear? I have my own gear. All right. So, yeah, we're going to, you can come dive with us. And I'm not a, like a viewer. Like, I don't like doing shipwreck dives. I yeah. like grabbing stuff, yeah. finding random stuff. So, yeah, if you come help us out, you're going to be busy. I am going to. And we're going to have <laughs> really dope content, which can come along right with this. But, yeah, yeah, thank you so much, man. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.